part of the ongoing Chandigarh Arts and Heritage Festival. Today we have as our artist Dr. Sudhir Patwardhan from Mumbai. I now request Mr. Devan Manna, the chairman of the Chandigarh Kala Academy, to please introduce the guest. Uh, Dr. Patwardhan, if we, if I can, uh, with uh, all this experience of a few years in the world of art, describe him. सज्जन पुरुष हिंदुस्तानी आर्ट के सबसे जेंटल ह्यूमन बीइंग हु एम आई हैव कम अक्रॉस अ जेन्युन कंसर्न कमिटेड आर्टिस्ट सुधीर पटवर्धन जी आई हैव बीन टॉकिंग टू हिम फॉर द लास्ट फ्यू इयर्स टू इनवाइट हिम टू द एकेडमीज फॉर आई हेयर बट ही इज़ बीन समहाउ मैं नो बिजी फर्स्ट हिज वर्क फॉर बींग Uh, incorporated into a marathi play and then after that he had to go to chicago now we are lucky in a way the more it got delayed earlier it was only for a slide lecture now we have been able to you know get him for this five day workshop which is going on here yeah mumbai meri jaan for the artist sudhir patwardhan it certainly is the city that harbors the dreams of millions of indians aspiring for dhan daulat and Shan Shaukat is not simply this artist's residence or place of livelihood, but more significantly his muse. The city's people and their lives, whether humdrum, desperate, chaotic, frenzied, maddening or sedate, form the textures of his intensely perceptual works, prompting the title of Complicit Observer on a monograph of his works by the art critic Ranjit Hoskote. The seated people in his paintings, whether in a cafe or the suburban train, seem to wordlessly extend an invitation to the viewer to communicate and converse, breaking the often claustrophobic shell of isolation that envelops the city bred. As, he, as the artist himself says, the need to relate to the unknown common man was ideological and personal, arising from his own experience of transition from an essentially provincial middle class milieu to an industrial metropolis. Born in the newly independent India, Sudhir Patwardhan studied medicine at AM, AFMC Pune. About three decades as a radiologist ensued, but even during his medical practice, an early passion for painting remained strong. And in 1979, he held his first solo show at Ibrahim Al Qazi's Art Heritage in New in Delhi. This has been followed by about 20 solo exhibitions across the country's major art centres, and participation in major exhibitions of contemporary Indian art in London, New York, Paris, Geneva, Perth, and Muscat, among many others. Commenting on Patwardhan's portrayal of the human body, the critic Hoskote interprets its focus on the muscular physique as a sign of the spirit's fortitude, its ability to weather the vagaries of history and nature. Others have been struck, as we too are sure to be, by the truth and genuineness that emanates from the paintings, indicative of deep moral conviction. The artist's works have evoked much interest among art critics and historians who have extensively written in Marathi and English on his drawings and paintings. His life and works also form the subject of the film Sacha, produced by Anjali Montero and K.P. Jayashankar. Last year his paintings inspired the play Chitra Goshti, written by Sushma Deshpande and staged by the theatre group Avishkar. Sudhir Patwardhan's curated exhibition of Indian contemporary art, Vistamarik Shitije or Expanding Horizons, toured across Maharashtra in 2008-09 and was followed by his second curated project in 2011, showcased in Mumbai and Pune. The National Gallery of Modern Art, New Delhi and Mumbai have permanently housed some of his works. Besides many other private and public collections, the Rupankar Museum, Bhopal, the Jehangir Nicholson Collection, Mumbai, and the Peabody Essex Museum and in Salem, USA, are also home to his creations. Today, the artist 
will talk to us about observation, expression and structure in the context of his works. Thank you, friends and members of the Chandigarh Lalit Kala Academy, especially Divan, who has been so generous and kind and has become a dear friend in the space of four days. Uh, welcome everyone for this evening. I am going to be showing uh, my work of the last uh, approximately 40 years. Uh, there are a lot of slides, so we may go at a certain kind of uh, brisk pace. I am going to start with work in the 70s, so, uh, my work from the 70s onwards and uh, it is arranged uh, roughly chronologically. I will not say that every slide is arranged chronologically, but the groups are roughly chronological. This is an early work from around 75. This is the time when I consider that my work really took on a personal meaning for me. The human body has always been at the center of my preoccupations. And throughout, throughout this 40 years, it has changed form, it has changed shape and changed context, but it remains in a sense my central preoccupation and the second preoccupation I would say is the city of Bombay where I went to live in 73 and since then I have been living in from Pune I went to Bombay. This is a painting called Skin. Drawing has also always been an important activity for me. Drawing as not only as preparation for painting, but also as an independent means of expression. This is a drawing called New Growth. Screaming Woman. I was painting in oils, most of the paintings are in oil on canvas in this period. Later when I will indicate that I made a switch to painting in acrylics. Man with Cylinder. All these early works from the mid to from the mid 70s about 75, 76, 77. They are all the focus, my focus as an artist was mainly to express my own feelings, my sense of frustration, anger, depression or confusion or whatever. So the works were about the artist's feeling mainly and in that sense I would say that they were expressionist works. Slowly, I would still consider this work as it is a work called construction site. There is a worker who is removing his vest. The distortions that came in these early works were all, in, were all uh, to do with distorting the human body to express anguish or to express personal feeling. And as I said in that sense, they were expressionist works, but around this time, there was a slight shift and as you can see in this work that some indication of the surrounding of the figure. This is a work which is in the Punjab University Museum. It is called Crane and here observation of the context of the figure started to become important for me. So there is a slight shift from expressing my own feelings, expressing the artist's feeling to uh, observing, also observing the subject and the context of the subject. Uh, 
this is called green truck and you will see the, the rendering of the chain on the side and the details of the back of the truck. This was a slightly new development for me and the distortion of the human figure also underwent slight change that it did not distort, did, it did not express so much the artist feeling as an interpretation of what the, the subject that I was painting was. This is an Irani, this is called Irani restaurant. Irani restaurants were uh, extremely popular and for over 70, 80 years from the early part of the century right up to the 60s, 70s maybe some exist, some are still there but they are now mostly been replaced and they have gone but they had a whole culture as today we were saying that the coffee house culture where artists, intellectuals and everyone meets. So what was special about Irani restaurants was that apart from artists, poets, writers, intellectuals and journalists, there were also working class people that visited these. So cheap food, wonderful, they were all situated at the corner of a street and open on all sides with these mirrors. So, so observing, now you will see there is a shift from an expressionist standpoint to more emphasis on observation. This is also called green truck, maybe that one is called truck and this is called green truck. Observing the working class. This is the this is a period when I was I was influenced by Marxism and I was interested in my there were friends who were working in the movement and in TUs and things like that. So the working class figure was a central subject for me. Towards the end of the 70s, you will see that till now the works that I have shown, shown were mainly single figures. They were all single human figures at the cent placed in the center of the canvas mostly and with some context around them in the later part. But towards the end of the 70s, a more radical shift took place. And this shift had to do with the introduction of multiple figures and a more complex situation. Now when I say a more complex situation, it means that if there are multiple figures in a canvas, I treat figures as presences in a canvas and then each presence demands its own space. And so now the question was how do I structure a work like this to allow each figure his own space and how to relate the kind of tensions and connections between these different spaces with each other and create a structure that will hold all this together. So this was, this is called city. This one is called street play. As I said with my political connections and friends who are working as activists and things like that, a street play, a mill on one side and in the center is a performance of a street play going on and some audiences observing it. The way in which this work and the other works that I am showing you from this phase, the structuring of these works becomes more and more complex. And usually there is a kind of triptych structure, it's one canvas, but the structuring is th through a kind of triptych, triptych structure and with multiple perspectives, each, each area is treated slightly differently so that multiple happenings can be brought together or multiple presences can be brought together. This painting is strained. I was also interested in how 
on the street, for example, if one is standing at a bus stop, there's one person, then there's two people, there's three people, four people, and there's a line formed. What is the connection between these people? What, is, what kind of relationship do people at a bus stop in a city or people standing for a train on a platform? What kind of connections do they evolve in this short span of maybe two or three minutes when they're together? They form a certain connection and it dissolves. They form a connection and it dissolves. So the city is full of incidences of this sort when people are coming together, separating, coming together. So these human relationships that are momentary, but they have some meaning within the functioning of the city and the functioning of our psyche. So I was interested in that aspect of groupings. So a person standing at on the platform, looking at a woman who is standing at the door of the train, another person who is looking at that woman. So these trajectories of sight, these trajectories of seeing, which form multiple kinds of connections, were also part of the way in which the work is structured. Now I come to the title of my talk, which may have uh, intrigued some, some of you. But what is this about? Observation, expression and structure. So in, the, in these few years, seven or eight years from the time, uh, I started to paint in 1969 or so, but the first five or six years went in trying to discover what I wanted to say. And then around 1975 was, as I said, the first time that I felt that now uh, there, it, there was something that I could call my painting. Uh, and since then, till the early 80s, was a period, this was, within this period, I discovered three basic aspects that would interact in my work. There was the aspect of the artist's expression, the need to express yourself or as we were speaking in the workshop in the morning, the need to release your emotion, catharsis, the need for the artist to release pent up emotions within himself. This is one aspect of the work. The other aspect is observation, the need to see around you, to need to look and observe the reality around you. So that is another aspect of the work. And the third aspect, and to my mind the most important aspect, is the structure. Now, it is the energies of observation and the energies of expression that are channelized into the work to create a structure. And the structure is important because the structure is what gives visual meaning to the work. If the structure is weak, then expression can become sentimental. And if the structure is weak, observation can become mere reporting. But a strong structure is what will give all these elements a, let's say, a plastic meaning or, or let's say, a visual meaning. So this, in short, is the way in which I, I, I understand. Of course, there are various ways in which, but all the work that I've done I, I find it useful, it is a simplification, you cannot apply it strictly to like, but at times I find that observation predominates in my work, at times I find that expression predominates, but I am always conscious that ultimately it is the structure that will give meaning to the work. In the 80s, we moved from staying in uh, the central part of Bombay to the suburbs and this initiated an interest in uh, a return interest to painting landscape because at that time uh, the suburb where we had shifted to Thana had much more open spaces and my interest in a, a painter like Cezanne was again kind of brought to the fore. These are small landscapes that I did in an area in Thana by going and painting on the spot. My interest was twofold. One was to, as Cesar would do, 
to transfer visual sensation directly, to interpret visual sensation directly on the canvas, not to work from a sketch or from a photograph, but directly sitting in front of the motif as such. A second intention which was more to do with my ideological kind of beliefs that art should reach out to more people was to allow people from that area to see how an artist works. So there was a whole three year period when I was working with uh, working in that area and which ended in five shows taken uh, to different parts of that area in schools, in some factory compounds and things like that. This painting and the one that is coming after this, I would like you to see the relationship between the figure and the background. The figure is standing in the foreground and there is a receding background behind the figure. And here a young calf is walking across a landscape which comes up from behind as such so that the space between what is behind and the figure in front is much less than what it is in the other painting. In the earlier painting where the space for the example those rocks near the head of that boy are far behind and the rocks behind this the back of the cow are much closer to her. Now I was interested in the kinds of things that Cezanne had done and which led to cubism. The how does one paint on a flat surface this difference of space and it is not a question of giving it depth but it is a question of while giving it depth how to retain the sense of it being on one surface. So it is a double problem you are giving depth often what illusionistic painters do is to give depth to negate the sense that this is one surface. But if one wants to emphasize it as one surface, then how do you do this? So those are the kinds of technical problems that were in my mind in this period. I used to go out and paint and this is kind of homage to Cezanne, artist with cycle. This painting is called Memory Double Page. Now while structuring landscape, another influence that came into the work was the influence of Indian miniatures and the way in which multiple perspectives are woven into, the, into one kind of structure. I am speaking mainly of Mughal Jahangiri kind of miniatures in which they have already accepted to some extent an European, European influence and they are trying to work perspective into their work and yet they are reverting back to earlier forms of miniature art where there is a kind of flatness where the, the, what is closest to you is at the bottom and what is furthest from you is at the top. So those kinds of influences and multiple perspectives in the structuring of a large landscape, memory double page. This is called town. The same principle one was exploring. Again, as I said in the question uh, with the paintings of the boy and the calf that how does one compress space that allow a depth on the canvas and yet compress it so that it feels as if it is all on one surface. Each, each part of it is crystal clear as if seen from near. There is a detail of this work of the small part at the right bottom some workers preparing to get ready for work for the day construction workers. This painting is called Nalla. We have hills like this outside our city, uh, Thana, 
and the Khadi. Khadi is the creek that goes between the hills and the town itself. This is the aspect of a city that I enjoyed most in the 70s in Bombay and Thana. There was no separation between residential areas, industrial areas, marketplaces. In any area, you would find all of them coexisting. And this gave a peculiar kind of, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it gave a peculiar kind of unity to life. You could imagine life cycles of people. that They, they worked here, they were uh, buying their stuff here, they stayed here. They, it was all within this. Another detail from this painting. In a very polluted nalla, this young girl is taking a bath. The way in which influences of what you have seen, apart from what you have seen in reality, that the figure of that girl actually comes from a Renoir painting. A Renoir painting of bathing girls, pristine landscape, blue waters, green foliage behind. And it's an extremely beautiful painting. And I loved that painting and that figure and I transferred it to this space. This painting is called Pokhran, which is the name. It's not to be confused with the uh, Rajasthan Pokhran. This is a Pokhran near where I stay. And this was the area which was undergoing rapid transformation in this period, where there was some industry, small scale industry in the earlier part, where, where housing was replacing most of that industry. And that black hole in the center is how many hills in Bombay have been excavated for building material and have been replaced by buildings. Now the way in which this painting is structured has something to do with the way in which Chinese landscape artists structured their work. The Chinese landscape artists went for a walk in a landscape, returned after the walk and then in the studio within one composition they painted different parts that they had seen along their way. So, in this sense, this person is walking up that, the person on the left of the painting is walking up that road to go to the top. So, the light here on the left side falls from behind him, but after he reaches the top and turns back, the light is in the opposite direction. So, this use of not just multiple perspectives, but multiple sources of light to to structure the work so that it suggests that this is not a, a scene seen from one point of view, not a scene restricted to one point of view, but a scene of multiple impressions of a particular place. Another painting of Pokhran. This is a painting called Fall. A construction worker is either jumping off or has fallen from the bamboo structure that they have built for the construction. The extremely beautiful tile work and for the design for which I took from a Mughal painting and the kind of dejected figure against, in a sense, a beautiful landscape but in my mind, it reflects the kind of what was happening to uh, the social fabric of the city around this time, that most of the industry having moved out, there was no longer an organized working class. Not, there's hardly any organized working class left. So, and most of the workers were reduced to casual labor. So all, all the working class was now unprotected. They were mostly casual laborers. And that was a kind of fall from grace, in a sense. And a growing industrial suburb in the background. I have not been talking about the way in which uh, 
what I said earlier, the way in which observation, expression and structure have been interacting in most of these works. But you can see that structure has always remained a central kind of necessity, that a proper structure to express visually the kind of emotion and the kind of observation that you have. There is another detail of this. While painting landscapes in this decade, as you would have seen, I had moved backwards and I was painting. When people came in, they usually came in as small figures or came in representing certain kinds of, they were much smaller than the normal. So, there was a sense in me that I am not kind of dealing enough or not being intimate enough with people. So, along with these landscapes and then into the 90s, I returned to the human figure in a big way. In a big way in the sense that that again took center stage for me. People seen uh, occasionally or in the clinic or on the street, uh, which I would hardly remember consciously, but which came out in various forms, drawings, pastel drawings, oil paintings. These are small works, maybe 12 inches by 18 inches or so. And drawings again, a few drawings. At this stage, people seen, as I said, seen on the streets or one encountered in life, but also other kind of people. There was also looking at artworks and imagining what kind of a person would this, this portrait have been of? You know, either in Dakni painting or in Mughal painting or a, or a Sanchi, Apsara. Obviously, that figure that we today appreciate as an Apsara who linked to a tree, uh, the sculptor who did it had an actual experience of an actual woman in mind. So, how, how does one go back from these representations to those people? Or how does it just imagine the life of people like that? Vermeer has this beautiful painting called Made Pouring Milk and the head actually comes from that painting but for some reason which I cannot explain, it is not a conscious thing but she is gagged as such, you know. Or here there is a kind of Flemish headdress and a giant mask, the kind of mask that Mahasathis wear. So, this coming together of what one sees in history in, in terms of his historical styles and the interaction of, so the presence, the human presence in art as such, you know, that was what I was trying to explore or just to get at. But always the immediate experience is the strongest and, and this kind of experience where a person is trying to retrieve his television set from flooding, from a flooded house. And here of course again there is a return to some extent to an expressionist kind of feeling, where there is a rapid brush stroking, scratching, etc. This painting is called Family. After, after a flood in a sense, after some kind of natural calamity or whatever. It is it's more a metaphorical kind of work. This painting is called Sleep. There is one kind of uh, chadar that is very popular in Maharashtra and the south which is called a Solapuri chadar which is woven in Solapur and around there. 
and uh, most of middle class families and most people in Maharashtra and Karnataka use this and I mean this is just an image which is in my mind the, the image on top uh, where I always uh, remember my father sleeping in that way completely covered up with the chadar and this kind of uh, maker of the gaddi sitting in front whom I would see while I was, uh, I was walking back from the clinic every day to home at night in the street lamp a person like this would be sitting and working. Vegetable seller. The small linkages that one makes in terms of uh, form while painting, the kind of linkages between the fingers of that vegetable seller and the beans lying in front of him. Visually, and also some very personal images, personal in the sense of again, this is like an image which serves a certain kind of catharsis. There is a certain kind of pent up emotion within you, there is a certain need for aggression, and you attack that paper. This is a charcoal work on a large piece of paper which I had to do uh, putting it on the floor and then getting into that position and attacking, attacking it almost. So the need for that kind of release. It's called manhole, another charcoal drawing. So there were people, I was painting, people, suffering people, people in trouble, private moments, people in love, people out of love. So people was the focus on every, every kind of imagined situation that we find ourselves in. Father and son. Bhaiya is a term that in Bombay is used for mostly UP laborers who come and settle down in Bombay. It's used slightly derogatory by the locals and mostly they stay in extremely poor conditions and with lack of privacy and things like that. And also loneliness is something that all people in the city have to face but especially <coughs> migrants who come without their family and and stay in the city and are connected with their family only once a year or, and things like that. So this is Bhaiya. This is called Balcony. Most paintings one struggles with in the sense that one makes sketches, one has to say something and there's various ways in which one is uh, trying to work out the composition, the structure and over a period of time then you arrive at what you want to say. But on few occasions, sometimes, it's as if a painting is gifted to you. This was such an occasion when I just walked to the window of my studio and looked at the building across the street and saw this person standing in this particular way in that balcony and it suddenly said so much to me. <coughs> Human vulnerability, nature and all our, and our cunningness too. You know, in a sense, the way in which he is hiding his face behind that shadow. So all these various things kind of came together and that single experience of looking at someone, immediately I knew that this was to be transferred as that image was just to be transferred as it is on a canvas. There are also elements one can think of that 
I was thinking of Mondrian, in fact. So the, the, the way in which abstraction and figuration interact is extremely interesting and there, there are various levels at which these things interact. And the kind of vertical and horizontal that work in Mondrian, the kinds of functions that they do. And here again, the reduction, conscious reduction to three elementary colors, to a, a yellow, a blue and a red, the red in the figure and the yellow and blue and the gray and the black lines. All these, st structurally, this painting is like a homage to Mondrian. Construction worker washing her face. This again, like the other work, in a flash while passing in an auto rickshaw, once at a construction site, one sees someone, a woman, throwing water from a, from a tub that is kept with water for workers to wash up after the day's work. And the way in which a gesture, a gesture which has one meaning of what she is actually washing her face, she is thrown her hands up towards, but the way in which that gesture can mean so much more than just what she is doing and how to extract the meaning of that gesture and take it beyond the immediate. The girl with nose ring. This is an extremely small painting. It's like 8 inches by 12 inches or something like that. And I was interested in the kind of iconic stretcher that one could give a small image. A stretcher like an Egy Egyptian sphinx, say. You know, a face that is, the actual face that is of a poor woman, where malnutrition has pushed her cheeks in and pushed her teeth out and it's actually a face of a poor woman, but which has an iconic kind of presence. Again, I have been showing you mostly when we uh, saw these pictures of single figures, single heads, people observed intimately. But living in Bombay, one is continuously living with crowds. A daily experience of crowds. And in trying to structure this kind of painting, where, where there are so many people in it, the experience of Ajanta, the way in which crowds are painted in Ajanta, came in extremely, it was a very important influence for me. The important thing is not to paint the crowd as seen from one point, so that you are closest to the person in front of you, but the person be away at the back is just a head popping up somewhere. So the workers, the painters of Ajanta, they devised this method of painting each level at eye, eye level, each, each row of men, each row of people at eye level, so that you have the feeling of actually entering the crowd and moving through the crowd. So that is the kind of uh, attempt in these crowd paintings. Being in a crowd, I mean most people would say that uh, being in a crowd in, is an unpleasant experience, but for me living in Bombay, I, I, it was a very important and I, I liked being in crowds. I felt a sense of belonging to some kind of common purpose, there was a rhythm in the crowd the way in which people move up a railway bridge, the way in which they try to catch a train. Of course, there's much uh, friction and much pushing and all that. But in spite of that, I used to enjoy the time that I spent within crowds. Then suddenly there would be a disruptive madman or a beggar at the center and everyone would try to create a little space so that they are not infected or touched.
but crowds and mobs also mean various other things and Bombay has experienced a, a major kind of shift in the way in which crowds behave or mobs behave from around 92 onwards after the riots after Babri Masjid was demolished. This painting is called Shak. There was an area where close to where we stayed and it was an area, a, a Muslim dominated area through which was a shortcut to my clinic. So I used to often walk along that. And till 92 and post 92 I had never felt any sense of fear or any sense of you know, I, I didn't never gave it a second thought. But after 92, the glances that one gave and one received, the, the, the suspicion that is put into the minds of people and which is like a vicious cycle. You, sus you give me a suspicious glance, I give you a suspicious glance and this multiplies into fear and it multiplies into a situation where the smallest thing ignites a riot. This painting is called Riot. There is a group of rioters on the top ready with their steel bars and swords and a crowd that is trying to disperse, save itself. And a detail of the painting, this mad woman sitting at that center, not knowing what is happening. A social worker trying to move her out of danger's way. But the question here is like, who is mad? You know, who, whom do you call mad? Is this woman mad? Or is the crowd mad? Is the mob mad? Painting is called Killing. This is also a killing. This, this, the hate, the viciousness. All this that kind of came to the surface. There was a time when one felt that essentially societies are harmonious and something that may happen that will disrupt this harmony and a riot will emerge or erupt and then after some time it will settle down and again a society will go back to its normal state of harmony. But now one more and more wonders whether the normal state of a society is uh, disharmonious. And we are happy to have some periods of harmony, but essentially there are going to be wars, there is going to be killing, there are going to be riots. Now, this kind of negative feeling overtakes you when you see things happening again and again the kind of street violence, the kind of... How does an artist deal with subject matter like this? Now, I was never in the heat of a riot, in the sense I was never running for my life. No one was coming behind me with a sword. Okay? But after being in the same city and after reading and after seeing images on the television and after seeing all the reporting and after one wants to say something about it. How does one do that? Where does one get the experience? Often it will be said, what have you seen? You know, people have suffered. What have you suffered? It's true. The artist has not personally suffered. But you have things within yourself to which you can revert. You have emotions, you have experiences for example, in dealing with this kind of subject matter, a simple experience of fear 
where does the fear come from suppose i and my wife are traveling late at night in a train or somewhere and suppose some rowdy gundas or whatever come into the train and one is in a situation where what does one if they start acting smart what does one do one is in a situation how does one deal there is an experience which you have felt the fear that has creeped into your bones and personal experiences like that can then be transferred to painting images that are of more social significance in a sense the tortures that one years of after i had arrest their police tortures use of power misuse of power this painting is called death on a street and then in the end is also the indifference ye to hote rehta hai koi marega koi marega this will go on and then there is indifference in society after 2000 the city itself i mean the city did start changing as i said after the mills closed and after the mills closed started to close after the textile strike in 82 and then afterwards that area of bombay which had the mills the mill lands were sold and high rises started to come there so that change of the society that change of the city started around 2000 or a little earlier this is a painting called lower parel a mill a high rise building coming up and a stone bridge built by the british still standing and people around that bridge seeking to continue their life in some sense they are dealing with this change there is a detail of that which as i was thinking of dikirico strange surrealist landscapes while painting this abandoned now now of course after 10 years even this doesn't stand i mean the chimneys stand because they are nice advertising areas for people who have the malls that have come up the stone bridge and the life that goes on around that another painting from that area ullas nagar this is a very large painting very large in the sense it's about 14 feet uh, across made on four panels four canvases the changing city and i wanted to depict in a sense a kind of history of urbanization I have a few details. Maybe I'll show the details and then go back to the full image. On the right side, on the outskirts of the city, which which kind of uh, merges into the area outside the city, which is countryside. And then these are power mills, and there's a beautiful kind of. A river flowing and then there is of course the growing city and the growing housing and the pollution in the the nalla itself there is another detail of a part of that where there is a carcass of a buffalo or something lying on the lying on the sands on the side and this kind of whirlpool image of polluted river it was a kind of it's a kind of history painting too in the sense that it's about it traces what 
it may be a city's growth and decline may be like and it's painted in at different different parts of it are painted at different times of the day the way to break this up into segments was to paint different parts of the painting morning afternoon and dusk more and more the city in bombay has seemed to me like it's now on a on the brink of collapse almost you know the infrastructure the way in which the city has grown so this sense of putting together these fragments of the city where the structure is as if it's barely being able to hold these together the growth of jopat patti is the growth of informal tricks uh, and the growth of various things and the lack of basic amenities another detail of that a painting called clearing the way in which the city is the growth of the city is dictated not by administrators or not by a, a planning uh, uh, an authority which is planning 20 years ahead for the city but the way in which builder a builder lobby and mafia land mafia almost rule another work from the same period these are diptychs painted on two canvases quite large a uh, detail of that this painting is called bylane saga the kind of life that goes on in the bylanes on one side you see that the old man and the woman with the child and on the other hand you see some kind of a violent act taking place and below you see these people either going to work coming back from work life goes on in a sense the structure of this painting derives from the kind of uh altar pieces in churches where there are different stories there are parandelas and then there are different stories at, in different parts and then there is a central area where either the crucifixion or an image of christ is placed and in this work that area is empty because we have no savior in that sense this was a particularly kind of dark phase for me personally because I was, I was trying to cope with living in the city and and feeling that things have changed to an extent that it's difficult anymore to cope with this a detail of that now from 205 this this kind of problem with uh trying to deal with the city uh, or trying to deal with our experience my experience of the city led me to withdraw to some extent into oneself and into the studio in a sense and i started to paint images from the studio and things like that and that was also a period of examining what being an artist meant at various levels this painting is called studio ghosts so when an artist is alone in his studio doing his creative work but there are various things that come in for example the window shows you what is outside the studio and the painting is again on on the left border is a painting which is in progress so that also connects with the outside but there are other presences there are other people who inhabit imaginarily in in the mind of the artist they inhabit you and they and they are your conscience in a way they are questioning you they are guiding you so all these presences these studio ghosts coexist with you in the studio this painting is called abstractionist 
what happens when an artist what what does an artist extract from his experience of the city so that that landscape of houses behind and the work that is on on his easel the kind of drawing an abstract drawing that he's doing and you see he is sitting and at his at the base of the painting is a crumpled kind of uh, chadar so this process of making beautiful this process of extracting something from reality and making it beautiful against the kind of negative uh, or the not negative but the kind of subconscious uh, charges that you have to deal with during the process of creation and this painting which is also up on the thing is called difficulty in telling the truth it shows an artist sitting with his back to us facing what is a painting in which his self portrait is there there is a window on the left which is a real window and there is a window in the painting of course both are painted but one is interpreted as a window in the painting and one is interpreted as a window as a real window one is in interpreted as an image of the artist and one is the artist himself an indication of what this implies what what this is hinting at is given at the right corner there is a palette and on that palette is a blob of paint white paint as if you go close to it in the painting it is actually a blob of white paint in the painting it also represents a blob of white paint so this slippage between reality and representation what is represented and what is real an artist is continuously dealing with this or trying to deal with this so this is an uh, uh, an oblique reference to that this is rather different painting for me these are paintings to do with the life of an the in, inner life of an artist this is called witness and it's the image of a romantic it's the image romantic image of an artist or an image given to us in the romantic tradition artist as seer artist as madman who because he is different from other people can see truth in some kind of he can penetrate truth there's a painting from leonardo's angel on the rocks and there is a uh, akamirax persian painting on the other side so an artist is witness to art history to other painters and to other painters struggle to reach truth in some way there are other indications of his festering wound of his um umbilical cord so these are various kinds of meditations on being human and being an artist the connection between what is the difference between an animal and an and a human being you know various questions it would be too kind of complicated to hint at them this is a painting called grey chamber on the ceiling is a a pile of female nudes covered partly with this blue kind of cloth it's an image taken from a uh, austrian painter called gustav klimt but changed the figures are not changed but the pattern on the cloth is changed sensuality sexuality desire passion and death on 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 the table below is this pile of dead bodies there is always some connection in our mind between passion and death these deep kinds of emotions work themselves out not only in abstract terms but in but in real family situations too 
there is an old person in the family he is on his deathbed or lying there are people taking care of there are people who are tired of taking care of him there are people who are looking to benefit from his death and then there will be guilt about all these feelings in those people it's called full circle because there's also a child there's a boy there all these people are going to live through this aggression guilt love hate and then it's going to again come back in the next generation and in the next and in the next this training is called silence a couple who has grown old together they're silent because they have said everything and they understand completely or they're silent because there is they find that there's nothing more to say and it's an uneasy uneasy silence this one is called mother another drawing of a couple after 205 i said there was a period a longish period after 207 especially when i did a series of works on the studio on the family on the self this one which is up on the flags outside is called nostalgia it is an image that came from a photograph taken many a small photograph taken many years ago of my mother and shanta my wife standing on the balcony of course everything else is changed the house within is changed and the landscape outside is changed but this coming together of inside and outside as i said if i withdraw from the world but the world always exists there and there is a way to return to it a kind of gaire bahire of ravindranath or of satyajit a detail i think but i think when i seen such large details that nostalgia for the reason that when i painted this uh, not too long ago maybe 3 or 4 years ago and there was a period in the 80s in which my experience as i as i showed you those landscapes of suburban bombay of thana as it was in the early 80s uh, when i experienced that landscape the sun on those uh, small houses and trees and things like that i felt no difference between the outside and the inside those landscapes were as if they were inside me and as you have seen that later the way in which the city has changed the way in which my perceptions have changed have uh, that feeling has left and so there is a nostalgia for that kind of an harmony with the outside this one is called father story they are sitting on a platform railway platform waiting for it's a journey maybe when one comes towards the end of one's life there are many things that have been left unsaid and before passing away there there is a need many times to communicate things which were uh which may have caused misunderstandings which may have caused various kinds of things so there are stories and stories and that that empty landscape behind the two figures is some indication of how this complex and ambiguous space uh that exists between people of unsaid things will will be always i suppose i leave you now with two recent drawings a man thinking and a man enjoying the breeze in the train thank you thank you, you. sudhir ji uh, many of you who do not know probably uh maybe some of you who came late sudhir dr sudhir 
has been living two lives simultaneously. He was a practitioner of radiology, running his clinic, at the same time painting. Like for God knows how many years, maybe three decades, his practice was seven, seven. o'clock <laughs> to the studio, then nine o'clock to the clinic till 12, come back home, then till six in the studio again, from six to nine, again in the clinic, all three different places, home, studio, home, clinic, studio, home. What a disciplined life, you know. He's been a great obser observer of life, uh, as you've seen in his work. And this kind of discipline and proper understanding, philosophical, and at the intellectual level, dealing with various aspects of life is not an easy task. It, he looks a very simple man, but how complex and how easily he can, you know, make us understand the complexities of the human mind. Thank you so much, Sudhirji. Before I invite you for uh, the question answer session, I would like to tell you that there are books available which have been published on him and we have kept, kept specimens of those books outside but they are not available now. If you book them in advance, we can get them for you and give them to you very reasonably priced. In fact, underpriced I would say. Books are for 950 rupees each. If they were published by any other publications, it would be 5,000 rupees or more. And uh, catalogs, unfortunately, not. We have also uh, printed and uh, prepared some memorabilia souvenirs outside uh, with his kind uh, permission. He's given us the copyrights to produce them, which are also available. We are thankful to you, Sudhirji. And one thing more, which he may feel a little embarrassed about, I would like to share with you. Because it's a public fora, it's a public academy. He has refused to take the honorarium which we normally give to the artists who come to you know, uh, do these workshops. In fact, uh, he has taken the check and given another check back to the academy. Thank you so much for this donation to the academy. Why am I sharing with you is because uh, like, there are human beings who, uh, who touch you. Like his wife, she's come along with him she said I would pay my own, you know, fare. She even insisted, which I did not accept, that she would pay for the rent. She's sharing a room with him. She wanted to pay for the rent. She wanted to pay for even the food she is eating. See, these are the kind of people who are so generous, who are so, you know, forthright in their living and creating such wonderful paintings, sharing with us the complexities in which we live today. Thank you so much, Sadhiji. Any questions, please? On, on actually length, you've talked about the, how you structure your painting, yeah. how sometimes there are more than one spaces in your work. And I must say, you know, there are very, uh, some of, of your works, they're very eerily, you know, sort of silent and empty. But then at the same time, you have some works which are very overcrowded. Again, I mean, keeping that in mind and uh, Hearing what Divan sir in your introduction said that some of your works are sort of getting extended into theatre. How, how do you think theatre being an extension to your work? So give us some insight about that. I'm, I'm quite curious how, you know, when you structure everything uh, in this uh, more or less aesthetic medium and then yes. something goes into which is more, uh, you know, dynamic as a, as a theatre, especially Marathi theatre keeping in mind so yes. kindly and thank you so much for coming to Chandigarh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the one has been close to theatre in the sense one has been following, one has been seeing theatre. Marat for Maharashtrians theatre is an important uh, way of uh, you know communicate. I mean it's, it's an important art form there and uh, when I was approached with this uh, by the director and writer of the Sushma Deshpande, uh, I was in fact definitely uh, thrilled. Uh, what happens to a painting when it is uh, taken into a the theatrical production? Uh, there are many things that can happen, you know. And I saw that my paintings, uh, being uh, the kind of narrative, the essential thing that is communicated to people is a kind of human story. Now the paintings also, as we have talked about structure and as you rightly pointed out, uh, as a painting, uh, that story is communicated in a particular way. In the theatre, by animating it, 
what they did was actually they, they chose some of the paintings and there would be characters dressed as the characters in the painting. The painting would come on stage and then it would go, go off stage and these characters would be standing behind almost in the same position as they are in the painting and they would enact a story, an imagined story which was not my story but which the actors, and this was important for me that it was not just the director or the writer who devised these stories, but I worked uh, with the actors and allowed the young actors, mostly very young actors, allowed these actors to come up with different stories. And then they chose, the, the director chose certain stories. So this is how it, uh, you know, uh, went ahead. And uh, it was a very fine experience enjoyed by many people. They thought that it's an important new step uh, for me, I think it's, it's also a dangerous step in the sense that the idea that this paint, when, uh, as you said, something in movement has been transformed into a static image, it's not easy to reanimate it, you know, and there's every possibility that it's done in a literally simplistic way or you choose on only the human element and not the kind of plastic element, not the, not the element of the structure. So those were pitfalls, there were some problems with that. But I would love to see, I mean I would love to interact with people who want to because they can derive various things and I would love to see other kinds of paintings, you know, a more abstract painting, a more surreal painting being transformed into a theater theatrical production. That would be probably even more exciting. When you had this collaboration uh, between you as an artist and a theatre director, yes. did the paintings that they used, uh, which we have seen, is a moment, yes. is a moment which has come yes. together, That's right. uh, but it, it has a whole history of experience in that moment. Yes. Uh, and you create your own narrative when you watch the work. Yes. So when it was transformed or translated in a production, yes. um, how did they make the connections? Was it just the painting projected at the back? And uh, like, you know, we have an exercise in theatre where we give our students a picture mm. and we tell them that before this picture was shot, what happened before, yes. then they come That's together right. and what happens after the picture has been clicked. So I'm very interested yes. to know how the whole thing uh, yes. was uh, managed. In fact, uh, what you're saying is very, I mean, that was uh, mainly the way in which they were given this moment in a narrative and asked to think about, as you said, where it may have come to this moment, how it may have come to this moment, or how it may proceed from this moment. They actually printed on flax like these. Yeah. Uh, the paintings in the actual size mostly and they carried the paintings in and out you know uh, as they so it was not a projection but the physical kind of sense of that painting being there or sometimes it used to be on the side of the stage when the enact enactment was taking place but as i said earlier uh, there were many ways in which many other ways in which this can also take this was one instance when one director and a group of artists who are mainly interested in human stories. And my work lends itself to, I have no objection, in fact I have never had an objection to people who can enter the painting uh, just as stories. Though I know that this is an incomplete way of looking at the painting. That friends and painters will see this in a more complex way. But ordinary people, if I show in Jahangir for example, there are thousands of people who come and enjoyed this as just a scene, just something happening and they do not necessarily see it as a painting. But my belief is that if, I mean it goes back to uh, an ideal in classical art, that if something can be structured or presented in a way in which there are multiple levels at which it is accessible, then each person will access it at that particular level, but also that accessing at one level will lead that person or open the roads for that person to move towards another level, towards a more complex level, you know. 
and we tried to do with that that with the actors themselves we had workshops with the actors to try and see that this is not just a story but it is more you know this coming together the language of painting it's more than just a story so to whatever extent it actually you know took place i, th I think it was successful to an extent thank you i was just curious um, to know about the relationship between your ideology and uh, your pictures uh, for example uh, i mean if you say for instance are expressionist uh, and then at the same time you also marxist and uh, you also trying to portray a reality i noticed that you know the worker pictures the pictures of the workers now you know the workers are much stronger you know they seem much stronger there's nothing of like you might say the emaciation or nothing of you know that kind of uh, physical um, trouble um, or to the body uh, that seems to be reflected in the strength now i read it as a sort of idealization perhaps or maybe as your wish perhaps that a worker should be like that or he should be strong enough in this you know in this physical form and uh, is that i mean how how does expressionist and realist you know tendencies and impulses come together and how do they relate to what you believe in uh, you know uh, i was yes. i mean the painting just aroused that curiosity about uh, how yes. you approach it. i think your question relates mainly to uh, the earlier work of of working class figures and i would say that the the distortions in those and in the early works which are expressionist uh, they when when the worker's body appears strong it's not as if it's made muscular but there is a kind of strength that is imparted uh, which is as i saw it a result of the the kind of there is a centripetal force and a centrifugal force working on the figure in terms of forming the the form coming to uh, fruition and there are these uh, forces from outside which are trying to destroy it and there are these forces from inside which are trying to resist that and i am trying to give expression to an understanding of the of what results from this and there is an idealization in saying that the worker does prevail not in the sense that he becomes strong and he is no longer a real person but in the sense that because these images that i did were not were in the sense i would have liked them to become self images for the people that i was painting so in the sense if they saw themselves like portrayed like this it would give them some sense of dignity some sense of so that was the thought behind these and the ideology is in that sense connected with empowering people who are at a disadvantage talking about the influences uh, uh you've not mentioned about the, the the artist one artist i felt uh, uh i mean i could relate your works to like i mean basically mexican muralist oh, yeah. or 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 probably i mean especially diego rivera yeah. or or for that matter of fact lori to an extent i mean so yeah. uh, i mean would you like to talk about it like yeah. uh, i mean were you were you actually inspired from them and i mean or or it's just a coincidence and like yeah no it's it's not a coincidence definitely the mexican muralists have been a major influence and when i showed you the painting of the crowd uh i mentioned ajanta but rivera uh, uh, rivera is definitely another influence on those paintings and uh, also because of the ideological intent of those paintings of education of being public uh, murals so all that ha has definitely influenced me there's definitely lori i i like his work but maybe there's there's a kind of i would say that works like bupen kakkar's are are more in in that satirical slightly comical manner you know and uh, i'm probably not that comical as lori can be comical in the sense is tragic of course but there's also that element of you know other element but yeah mexican muralist definitely is and there are i'm sure so many other influences you know i had a question
question uh, with your with your recent works. Uh, how important has photography been a part of your practice, uh, especially for your older works? I would imagine that you know taking your shot on a film and getting it developed. I don't know how much of that you'd use, but especially now that photographs yes. can be taken on a click of a phone, oh, yeah. how how has that influenced your practice and how has that changed? Has it changed or not? Or has it influenced your practice um, yeah. more recently? Since the last maybe 20 years or so, definitely photography has entered into the practice in a major way. Before that, it was more traditional in the sense of carrying your sketchbook while you're moving about, making those quick notations and things like that. But uh, since these small cameras became available, carrying a, a small digital camera and then making a record of things on the camera uh, was a more convenient way of doing it. Uh, I always draw from photographs again. You know, I have those photographs. I have a huge collection of photographs that I've usually done my, most all of them are done by me. So I use photographs that usually I have taken. I don't use source photographs usually, but I may at times. And I make drawings from those photographs. So there is this intermediate stage where again, from a, the photograph doesn't go into a painting directly. A photograph becomes a drawing. And while becoming a drawing, this process of elimination, changing, changing relationships, emphasis, all this occurs. So when it gets through the stage of painting, all this is transferred and then multiplied in a sense. There are other instances ex when I showed you the work, uh, when I said there are large diptychs of cityscapes. So those I worked with photographs, I worked on Photoshop, I did a lot of uh, a kind of collaging of different photographs and uh, a, a lot of changing of uh, you know perspective in Photoshop, a lot of distortion of perspective to make a kind of jigsaw. When I said these, these structures which are almost collapsing. So what I had in mind was a vague sense of what kind of structure I was looking at. And then with the source of thousand and more photographs, I was looking at different photographs to be able to collage them into this structure. So I would make drawings of the structure and then try to collage these uh, photographs into. So photography does play a major role. Also in other ways, uh, I suppose, you know, ma many ways. Yeah. Another thing about photographs is uh, uh, what I've thought of is uh, many people say, ki, is it better to work from photographs or from drawings? You know, is it better to make a sketch and use that, or is it better to make uh, something from a drawing? So, for, in my mind, the the conflict is not between a photograph and a drawing. The conflict is between looking at nature directly and looking at a photograph. And what I extract from looking at a photograph, I've always seen that place myself earlier. Because I have taken the photograph and I have made a decision to click that. So there is an experience of the place, there is an overlapping experience of a photograph, the way in which it has, that, that experience has been reduced in a sense and flattened in terms of pixels and things. And then there is a drawing from that photograph. So there are these multiple stages through which a transformation occurs and then they get, yeah, sorry. I think that's all. Thank you very much, Sudhir. Thanks. Pratwardhan Ji. Thank you once again. Thank you, Ji.